During Victorian Healthcare Week, I was lucky enough to spend some quality time with THT Plus members MTX. And we got to do a deep dive into a discussion about mental health and integrated behavioral health, two incredibly important aspects of healthcare that require innovative solutions and collaborative partnerships. So today on the podcast, you'll hear me speak to Denisha Alacock, public health strategist at MTX, and Brian Tan, chief health officer at Salesforce. And in this episode, we talk about how do we ensure that patients receive the best care for their mental well-being, as well as their physical health, and how can technology play a role in connecting all the different players across the healthcare ecosystem. Plus a lot more too. Collaboration starts with a conversation. Team Health Tech, let's make it happen. This is Talking Health Tech with me, Peter Birch, featuring content and community about technology in healthcare. Denisha, Brian, how are you? Doing well, how are you? Good, good. Thank great, you. thanks, Peter. Thank you. So um, let's start. It's great to be here in the MTX booth with good representation across Salesforce and MTX here. I'm really keen to dive in and learn a little bit more about and what you're doing here at Victorian Healthcare Week. Denisha, firstly, can you introduce yourself? Tell us who you are and what you do. Hi, I'm Dr. Denisha Alicock. I'm the public health strategist at MTX. And from there, we work on strategically planning, helping the population health, creating innovative solutions that can obviously amplify the the, the grasp of how we help the population, but also create that scalability and flexibility that we need um, just in case any um, additional things may come up that we are not necessarily planning for within our solutions. Yeah, okay, cool. And Brian? G'day. G'day, Peter. Good to see you good again. See you, good to see you again. Yeah. <laughs> and g'day to the audience again. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us who you are, what you do. Um, Dr. Brian Tan, Chief Health Officer for Salesforce APAC, um, working particularly in the public sector. Um, and in my position, I have the privilege of working with a number of healthcare organizations across the ecosystem, yeah. uh, including mental health and in different aspects of mental health. And we're here at Salesforce with, together with our friends at MTX. Uh, who are some of our primary innovators. They use our platform as a platform for innovation. Mm. And they bring their best and their brightest minds to craft some beautiful solutions for our healthcare organizations. Yeah, thank you. Now, that's a good good kind of scene setter. And, mm. and I'm, uh, I'm really keen to dive into this topic around mental health and behavioral health in a second and how the technology can do that. However, just to really kind of clarify that scene, it's interesting how we're kind of leaning into this point around uh, you know, collaborative partnerships for innovation. Tell me a little bit more about that Salesforce and MTX interplay here before we dive into the discussion. Sure, and Denisha, feel free to chime in. But essentially, Salesforce's challenge is to provide enough capabilities, um, enough uh, interesting shaped Lego pieces um, <laughs> of the right sizes and the right shapes so that our partners and our clinical client organizations that we serve can have enough uh, things out of the box in order to create some beautiful experiences. Now, traditionally in our healthcare industry, um, a lot of healthcare organizations like hospitals and clinics will face a choice when they purchase a technology solution. They're either purchasing a SaaS kind of product, mm -hmm. if we're talking cloud-based, a solution as a service fully pre-configured, but if you want to change anything, you have to submit a change request and get stuck in change requests. It's on the roadmap. Well. On the roadmap. Oh, oh, yeah, on the roadmap. <laughs> You've heard that before. Or you purchase a platform as a service, yeah. which is full configurability, but nothing out of the box. Mm. So Salesforce about 10 years ago decided to invest very heavily in healthcare specifically to build out a product that had a data model specific to healthcare, um, aligned to an industry standard like FireR4, and then also to bring to bear all of these cool tools in the toolbox mm. that includes things like data visualization, AI, uh, integrations through API. Um, uh, stuff that the cool kids in the startups use, like Slack, for example, as well. Yeah. So as a clinician at Salesforce, I'm like a kid in a candy store. There's so <laughs> many toys to play with. And same, I'm sure, Denisha, you find at MTX. There's so many cool toys to play with that we mm. can craft up some truly innovative solutions that people haven't seen before. Yeah. In a way in which they also perhaps haven't thought of before as well. So yeah. that's that's what we're really excited about. Yeah, yeah interesting. Now, just to piggyback off of that, uh, MTX really focused on being innovative. So we use the Salesforce pl uh, platform yeah. and, um, and our business expertise. And we, we bring in the subject matter experts, such as myself, among others, to really um, work out the day-to-day -day task that takes up the time for us getting, specifically for health, getting those, those patients the, the health outcomes that they need, right? Yeah. The best health outcomes. So in particular, MTX is innovative. And like I said, a kid in a 
candy, candy store, I get to sit there and be like, I wish I would have had this when I was working there. Mm -hmm. And that's what, we able, that's what we've been able to do, um, specifically with contact tracing. Um, I remember in particular that it was, we used to do it um, on paper. Mm. Now we have a, a technology that can um, create that intuitive process for, you know, your investigators to really make sure that we're getting the right questions, answers, and really um, and minimize that spread of that infectious disease at that particular point in time. Now, that's a great kind of primer and scene setter for this. You know, there's a lot of challenges to solve within healthcare and uh, that, that require innovative solutions and not one particular, mm. you know, technology or, or, or solution is going to do it. it requires those partnerships yeah. and collaborations. One of those really important um, areas and difficult ones to solve in healthcare is around this space of mental health that we've been um, speaking about quite a lot. It comes up, it's, it's pervasive across the, the system. I'd love to dive in a little bit more about um, not just mental health, but, you know, these nuances around like this integrate this topic around integrated behavioral health. So maybe Denisha firstly, like talk to me a little bit more about integrated behavioral health and, and how that might differ from just your traditional mental health. So it's really important to just define it. What is integrated behavioral health, right? And that is particularly where you have your behavioral health um, clinicians um, sitting at the table with your physicians that are doing your everyday um, uh, work with their patients, whether that's chronic conditions that they're working with, whether that's, you know, flu symptoms, you know, Brian and I were talking about that earlier. But what we do know is that um, them sitting at the table can be, it's going to be a patient-centered approach where um, a lot of those times when you have like chronic conditions, they um, can be exacerbated by mental health, right? Or mental uh, behavioral health uh, concerns, right? Or um, we, we can work together as a team to make sure that we're not just focusing on one specific problem for that patient. We're focusing on all the things, their overall well-being. So it's important to note that integrated behavioral health is making sure that you have um, every person at the table focus on that patient's care. Mm. Um, and all of that is in included in that process. Yeah. And Brian, you would have seen that too, like, yeah. like a similar theme to, to what we're talking about in terms of the, those partnerships. But I guess um, telehealth and digital plays a real important role in, in connecting all those different players across mm. that, that ecosystem, right? Yeah, no, completely. I, like, I, I like what Denisha is saying around a multidisciplinary mm. approach. I think mental health is one of those areas of clinical medicine and health care that is particularly dependent on a holistic approach to a person. Mm. Instead of just throwing a medic medicine at, a, at the problem, instead... I think we need to appreciate that mental health is not something to be cured, but it's actually like a chronic condition that um, our aim in the healthcare system is not to cure the condition, but to help maximize a person's mm. um, quality of life with mental health and to enable them to live their life to the full. So things like telehealth and other technologies, the focus there is not just the transactional interaction between the, the clinician and the patient. It's really about how you bring technology to the piece to have that longitudinal view of a patient yeah. and to enable everyone on the multidisciplinary care team who may actually work for different organizations as well and not have the license sign on in just one organization, but be able to see that integrated care plan from a truly holistic picture. Yeah. I think mental health is one of those archetypes in, in medicine that really that will fit very nicely. With. I just want to add mm. that um, when we're talking about having that multidisciplinary team, we're also talking about that patient sitting at the table too. Mm. So they can be mm. informed about the decisions and also take action in their own care, right? We, what we do know is that when patients are part of their treatment plan, we are seeing more successful adherence to medication, obviously any additional things that they may have to do, we're seeing better outcomes. So when you have that uh, collaboration, we're gonna see better outcomes and what technology does, it provides, you know, like that front door in particular, yes. it provides that patient being able to access it right real time, data, information, their healthcare, their, um, anything that they would like to know about themselves. Sometimes you you forget five years ago that you took this particular medication mm -hmm. and it could have adverse side effects or anything of that nature. But patients will be able to sit at that table and oh, that's what that. integrated behavior health oh, is I love really that, important Yeah, our primary research at Salesforce suggests that 71% of healthcare consumers, and we surveyed about 16,000 healthcare consumers here and around the world, about 10% of them came from ANZ. And 71% of healthcare consumers say, we manage our own care. So despite as clinicians, at the end of the day, we protest, no, we coordinate the patient's mm. care. Actually, in real life, patients manage their own care. Yeah. So I can write a, a medication on a script for a patient, but they're still deciding, can I actually afford this medication? Yeah. Do I actually want this medication? Um, my desk clerk might um, have 
uh, uh, scheduled an appointment in three weeks for the patient. But the patient's still thinking, I've got kid drop-offs in mm. three weeks' time. I've got a shopping run to do. Can I actually make it to the next appointment? Yeah. And I think so often we think about it from a patriarchal model of healthcare, but mental health is really one of those cutting edge parts of medicine where I think it's pushing the boundaries of the old patriarchal model mm. and shifting towards consumer, consumer direct care and well, yeah. self-managed care. And it's a bit like, I guess, even pre-pandemic, let's say, everyone, we, we use this marker of the, of the pandemic in terms of either or of, of um, uh, how healthcare has changed. But I know mm. that when we talked about, you know, what role telehealth might play uh, mm. it, 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 many looked at mental health as a good use case for um, a telehealth right. consult right. because, but what we were trying to do then is replicate the in-person consultation because you don't need to touch the patient. So it's great for a video consult. And that was kind of the breadth of the um, right. discussion around telehealth and digital services. But what you've described there is is a much more kind of the holistic approach you're giving data available to people at a particular time so is that how kind of things have changed in terms of this landscape Denisha, in terms of telehealth post-pandemic no it's it's really important to know before um the post-pandemic uh we did have telehealth but it wasn't widely known to after uh, during the pandemic and mm. then it became mainstream and widely acceptable it increased it, it increased the access so as everybody is shutting down how do you continue to reach out to your patients they still have to go to surgery they still have to get their medication they still have to make sure that they're doing whatever they can do to um, increase their quality of life, right? Mm -hmm. That's where telehealth played a, a big role in during the pandemic. And what we've seen from there is another big push, right? So now we have telehealth, but how can we utilize that? And and Brian and I were talking about this earlier. How can we use, utilize that to make sure that with the, with the physician work shortage that we can streamline it, right? How can we make sure that we get to the people underserved populations, the help that they need. And that's where telehealth plays a role, that we can um, get to them wherever they are, rural areas or not, we can assess them and get them started on their managing their, their, their health. Yeah. Mm, what isn't often known too is that when we look at the statistics from Medicare in Australia, there are about 800,000 claims for telehealth um, between the years 2011 to 2019. So that's an average of about 100,000 per year. In May of 2020, when we had COVID, there were 3.2 million claims in one month. So the, the telehealth claims had risen dramatically. But when you look at the data, 80% of those claims were using Alexander Graham Bell's technology for <laughs> telehealth, right? Yeah. So are we really pushing the technology envelope when we talk about telehealth? Mm. Or do we also need to think about telehealth beyond just the phone call? Mm. And truly starting to look at it from a consumer um, design picture of what a true uh, experience or engagement needs to be. Is it just a transactional phone call mm. or it's something much more meaningful that, that utilizes technology the right way yeah. and not the only way yeah. um, for that interaction? Yeah. I think about, you know, you've mentioned a few times uh, referencing bi different bits of data points to be able to paint this picture here, Brian, and mm. that there's, there's, there's data to demonstrate at a large scale that, you know, there's there's a definite uh, need for, for this kind of intervention within the, uh, particularly integrated behavioral health side. So, so and, and being in a digitally enabled model of care, obviously there's a lot more data that gets captured. So this point around data being able to inform care seems like an important one. Is there a role for data here and how we should be thinking about it in from mm. a vendor's perspective here to help um, I guess, inform better care from a patient side. You've kind of alluded to it already, but love to dive into that a little bit more about the role. Yeah, of absolutely. Uh, and Denisha, it'd be great to hear some examples in the US as well. But the, the, the data aspect, uh, medicine's a, a lot of complex pattern recognition. Mm. But for us as clinicians, a lot of times, we don't have the right data points or the right clues, diagnostic clues in our eye line at any given point in time to make the full decision. And I think sometimes what the data can do is increase the transparency um, of data in the eyeline of the user during their day job mm. and do it in such a way that it actually brings joy to their day job as well. Now, why don't we have transparency to all that data? We all know about a anyone who's been working in healthcare for uh, any length of time knows about the silos in healthcare, right? right? Either through work practice or embedment because technology isn't talking to each other. Mm. But then there's also like other kind of silos like legislative silos as well. Not too long ago, some of our states had legislation that said, the mental health record needs to be separate from the rest of the electronic health record. Mm. And so it almost stigmatized mental health and said, no, it's so sensitive that a clinician who wants to undertake holistic care can't actually see all mm. the data points too. So there's a number of moving pieces here, which have resulted in 
the lack of enough data points mm. in the eye line of the clinician when they actually got the patient in front of them yeah. to make the right decisions. I think data, therefore, um, transparency, but then also using new generation kind of technology around AI, pre-gen AI, but also gen mm. AI in future, about pulling those data points together and acting as a decision support tool for clinicians and you know, there's always arguments about should you have human in the loop? Should the AI actually take over the job of a doctor? Mm -hmm. uh, sidestepping those kind of conversations as well. There is no doubt. I think everyone intuitively knows that there is a role for AI. Mm -hmm. The extent to which it drives our decision-making clinical care is up for debate, but it's underutilized. I think that's a general recognition yeah. as well. Yeah. No, I would, I would like to add there, um, one of my favorite models is like, it's your Batman to your Robin, right? So technology is going to act as your sidekick, helping you take down or help that individual in particular. When we're talking about data points, you know, we discuss in particular, like um, you have a dashboard, you're able to see high level what's going on. And then you're able to drill down, right? When you see outliers, when you see, you know, these numbers increase, then you're able to drill down and really get to the point of the problem. And that's real time data, right? So when, as that data is being entered, it's being collected, it's being analyzed so that that clinician can make better decisions, but also for any policy holders or any different type of organizations that has a hand in the, the, the population health, as well as that individual care they're able to see what's happening, right? Yeah. And that's really important to know. The other piece is that when you're talking about mental health and you're talking about um, primary care settings, when you're able to share that data, uh, the, that primary care doctor is able to see, again, the whole patient, mm -hmm. right? So if you have something like a, 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 um, a patient experiencing an anxiety attack or and then they have high blood pressure and things of that nature, we know that certain things do trigger, do, it does exasperate certain pieces when it comes to a mental health and a chronic condition. And when you have that information, it's not in silos, when you have that information, that primary care doctor and you have them sitting at the table can make better decisions. Like maybe that medication wouldn't be the best if they're suffering from panic attacks because what we know yep. is that medication does have adverse side effects. And if they already are prone to having, you know, a rapid heartbeat, things of that nature, we don't want to put them there. Yeah. But when we don't have that sharing that data, when we don't have that information readily accessible for the clinician as well as that patient that is managing their care, there, there's gaps that are going to happen. And it obviously reduces the fact that they can have high quality of life, right? And it reduces the fact that they won't be able to get the care that they need. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I even I even think about from my own personal example, like with the data point, you know, you've talked about how, you know, having the ability to then reflect on that and, and perhaps benchmarking what a, a particular test might be and then looking at, well, what that might be against population. That's fine. But I guess from a, from a personal health perspective, you, you need that trend analysis as well, just because yes. the benchmarked that, you know, it says this, I've had like, you know, three different blood tests in three different <laughs> offices. And every time it's kind of like, well, let's start afresh. There's never like a historical mm. view, like basic stuff. A longitudinal that we just, view. Right. Yeah. And so surely there's this opportunity in healthcare right. to be able to paint that picture of not just for the clinician treating the patient, but for the patient as well to see over a period of time, whether that's progress or whether that's something that needs uh, potentially for intervention, data plays a huge role in that for sure. Completely, completely, yeah. Peter. I think that longitudinal view has been difficult historically because we've had systems in acute care, mm -hmm. then we've had a different system in primary care, and the mental health clinicians that I speak to bemoan the fact that 90% in New Zealand, for example, of mental health care happens at the GP coalface, mm -hmm. so 93%, 7% in the acute space. But those GPs can't see that really important 7% as well for an acute admission, for a suicide attempt, for example. How do they know that their patient is actually deteriorating mm. if they don't have transparency over into an acute encounter that happened in the yeah. last couple of weeks? Yeah. Same with Australia. The, the highest claimants for uh, Medicare mental health claims comes from the GP community, about mm. 100 to 150 per, uh, I think it's a 1,000 capita yeah. in Australia. Um, so the GP community is one area that c continuously finds in mental health, they don't have enough transparent mm. access to that longitudinal picture of the patient mm. that you're referring to as well. No, that's yeah. so true. Yeah. A lot of responsibility is there. The more we dial up the holding of data, the more we dial up the concerns around privacy and, and, the, and the issues around that. How, from a, from a technology side, the, thinking about some of those privacy concerns and the data security side, how can we address those effectively? It'd be really interesting, actually, from, from an Australian perspective as well. You know, we've got the yeah. Privacy Act and stuff. It'd be great to yeah. hear from you. Yeah, yeah I, I guess the issues around confidentiality, around security, cybersecurity as well, especially in mental health. Now, I, I would suggest that mental health, um, there are um, 
patient sensitivities around mental health in particular, but that's also a little bit of the fact that mental health tends to be stigmatized. I think in, yeah. in health and in life, we need to destigmatize mental health from that point of view as well, mm -hmm. so that people don't feel sensitive about their mental health and it starts to become just like any other chronic condition really. Yeah. We, we don't get stigmatized when so, someone has a heart attack, you know, we almost feel like it's, it's not, it, it, it's not a blameworthy kind of situation and yet mental health has this old stigma as though it's something around the person and something that they should be doing about it themselves, yeah. you know, but really that's what we need to destigmatize about the area. I think that will also lower the sensitivity threshold. But having said that, we also need to appreciate the need for sensitivity because a lot of consumers with mental health concerns have that concern and mm. that's their right. So we've got to respect that as well. How do we do that? It's a mix of both the back end technology and the front end technology, I feel, right? Yeah. Yeah. So Absolutely. in the back end technology, every healthcare organization now should be highly aware that there are both um, uh, deliberate and uh, unconscious attempts on uh, accessing patient confidential data and mental health is one of those particularly sensitive areas where uh, we've heard nefari nefarious agents feel that there's a, a high degree of risk and reward if mm -hmm. they can access uh, confidential information. We've had cybersecurity hacks over the last couple of years with healthcare organizations here in Australia that have hit the headlines and over in Singapore as well, which I cover the territory, there's also been some recent history there. Yeah, right. Those kind of attacks highlight the need for healthcare organizations to start looking at cybersecurity, to also look at uh, having roles in their governance structure, such as uh, chief information security officers, for example. Mm. Um, th those kind of roles are becoming increasingly important. And the emphasis on having a secure platform that is data resident, that respects the Privacy Act of Australia and not just the HIPAA kind of compliance mm -hmm. issues as well, mm -hmm. that has local regulatory compliance is also important in establishing a good trustworthy framework and platform for building your, your clinical workflows. Now in the workflow front end, there's a whole bunch of considerations there too. So not to bore the audience, I'm sure a lot of the, your audience members have already kind of covered this territory, but think things around um, making sure that you have the right role, access, reason, audit trails, auditability of why people are accessing certain people's records and what mm. parts of the records are being accessed. And then also having some break glass met methods as well. If say a certain region has legislation that protects the Mental Health um, Act, then uh, and the patient confidential data around mental health, then how do you have break glass in emergency situations for clinicians to also access that data? Mm. Um, I think that's all important. So I would definitely like to add, so us mm. utilizing the Salesforce platform, especially during the pandemic, because again, it wasn't mainstream for us in, this, in the States. We didn't necessarily, um, we, ha we have technology, but not in the way that we have technology now, right? So, um, you know, on the health side, uh, technology uh, obviously is there, but it's still behind, right? We were not there with the policies and procedures, right? But the technology does exist. What we've seen was, is that, like he said, when we can create rule-based information like who access who, who, who can see what, that makes sure, that ensures that we're protecting that patient's privacy, right? Um, that, that's really important to note, right? So when you're talking about that security and that data, not everyone has access to it, right? Not everyone is going to see that your, your patient information. So that sensitivity around mental health, although integrated behavior health will help destigmatize de, uh, de that, we're able still to protect your information. MTX prides itself on making sure that we uh, do our due diligence in protecting those private um, health information of individuals, and we utilize the Salesforce platform to do it, right? Mm. So we're HIPAA compliant, you know, FedRAMP, anything that's needed, particularly for that health organization, we're able to make sure we protect that information. IRAP over here as well. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. so we, we want to make sure that we do that, right? So um, the only way to do that, right, is that if those policies and procedures exist. So if you have a front desk reception that shouldn't have access to the patient, um, but they're checking that patient in, we have those rules. They won't see that information. They will only see the first and last name. It, it is up to the organization. The ideal MTX is able to implement exactly what your organization is looking for. Mm. Built on that Salesforce platform is highly configurable because because your workflow is different. Every organization is different. So you may have someone come into the front office. You may have someone go directly to the nurse. Um, even when it comes to vaccines, right? You can go uh, straight to a pharmacist in the state and they can they, they have access to the to the record and they can they can uh, administer your vaccine. Where versus you go to a nurse, uh, I mean a clinic, you go to the front desk first. Like there's there's always multiple stepping points 
to getting your access to care. And you want to make sure every stepping point that you ensure privacy and security around your information. And that's what MTX and Salesforce provides. What you've just described there in, in that particular example and in others too is that you know, th there's a lot happening at the organization level there, which might on the coal face sound like, well, this is part of what the, the clinic's perspective might be or the workflow, but it's done with the patient at the center in mind. I think that's, you know, in terms of protection of the patient's data and the mm. thinking about how the patient works through, through a particular clinic. So I guess that's a nice way as we start to kind of round out this conversation. And as we've heard here at Victorian Healthcare Week as well, often the conversations come back to how do we put the patient at the center of care and I guess increase that engagement and empowerment for a patient to, to um, uh, continue on that journey, particularly in this area of integrated behavior at health as well. Denisha, I guess if you were to then, we've, we've touched on it all, but just to close on some of those key points around the responsibilities of technology or the role that technology plays in really bringing the patient at the center of care here to improve that engagement empowerment, how would we kind of summarize that? So the biggest thing is um, technology allows convenience and access, right? So we're able to bring the patient based off of the technology we're, um, that we have, that we're able to provide, we're able to bring them to the table. Um, that's the key, key role here. Technology is going to streamline that that patient's care, right? It's going to bring the right people to the table, share the right information, it being protected as well, but also empower that patient to manage their care, right? You want to make sure you have all the information to make an informed decision about how your treatment plan should work. The technology provides that. MTX has built multiple solutions, making sure it's patient-centered focus, making sure that, you know, when you, as, as things as just language capabilities, right, is extremely important, making sure that that person is able to understand what is being said to them, what they are reading. And, and that's a, a key point there. We're building things to make sure it's accessible, it's easy, it's intuitive, it's, it's friendly. And, and, and configurable to make sure that we're not just meeting demand for today, but we're meeting the demand for the future as well. And Brian, that's that's relevant here in Australia as well as anywhere else in the world too, right? Yeah, I think we, we've touched on various topics today in our conversation around integration, confidentiality, having a secure platform for innovation. Mm. Salesforce is actually being utilized across the mental health spectrum by different organizations. And there's lots of different services now which serve mental health from the patient longitudinal journey that starts with the referral so um, uh, the likes of Turning Point, for example, that handles most of the um, uh, referrals from GP to special, specialty mm. care here in Victoria, for example, uses their platform built on Salesforce. Mm. And then when we go through to crisis call centers, another um, growing area of services um, in mental health, uh, the likes of SANE, for example, also use Salesforce um, for its platform for crisis call center and also management of complex mental health mm. uh, conditions too. And then we go through to the acute space with hospitals using it for their outbound community outreach teams in mental health and drug alcohol and toxicity, building out their community EMR on the platform as well um, in a new way. So we're effectively um, taking it away from just being a system of record towards being much more proactive, predictive kind of uh, platform as well for care in mental health there in the acute space. We haven't yet penetrated the GP market. We're looking for partners out there who are uh, uh, interested in uh, building out it's a the solution. the Wild West, but just saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so there's lots of opportunity there. Area. Yeah. <laughs> Given that mental health, you know, so much sure. of the burden of care is in primary yeah. health. Super important. It, it, yeah. the, the, I think the platform holds promise there as well um, mm. with all the digital tools that we have at our disposal yeah. to craft some beautiful innovations and also connect up with any of your source systems that you currently are using to. Yeah. Um, so across the mental health ecosystem, it's one of those interesting areas like aged care, like disability, where an innovation platform like Salesforce is meeting needs all the way from a federal level yep. uh, kind of view or through the way through state and then through individual providers, both in private, not-for-profit and in public sector as well. So really interesting um, spectrum of services yeah. that um, we could really innovate on. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's so much more to explore too. I love the fact that we've been able to speak to two clinicians in the deep in the technology game in Australia and across the world and, and, and speaking on a problem that's so important to um, anyone in particular uh, relating to their integrated behavioural health. So we'll put the details for MTX and, and Salesforce uh, in the show notes of this episode. And of course, MTX have the directory listing on the Talking Health Deck website. So guys, I really appreciate you making the time to have a chat today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Cheers. Thanks, Denisha. Thank you. you. Thank you, Ryan. For more content and community about technology and healthcare, visit talkinghealthtech.com.